ABCs of NMOSD is an education podcast series to share knowledge about neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMOSD, a rare relapsing autoimmune disorder that preferentially causes inflammation in the optic nerves and spinal cord. ABCs of NMOSD podcast series is hosted by SRNA the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association, and in collaboration with the Sumira Foundation for NMO and Guthy Jackson Charitable Foundation. This education series is made possible through a patient education grant from Horizon Therapeutics. Hello and welcome to the ABCs of NMOSD podcast series. Today's podcast is titled Neuroophthalmology and NMOSD. My name is Chrissy Dilger, and I moderated this podcast. This podcast series is hosted by the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association in collaboration with the Sumera Foundation for NMO and the Guthy Jackson Charitable Foundation. ABCs of NMOSD is made possible through a patient education grant from Horizon Therapeutics. Horizon is focused on the discovery, development, and commercialization of medicines that address critical needs for people impacted by rare autoimmune, and severe inflammatory diseases. They apply scientific expertise and courage to bring clinically meaningful therapies to patients. Horizon believes science and compassion must work together to transform lives. For today's podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Robert Shin. Dr. Robert K. Shin is a graduate of Yale University and received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He completed a neurology residency and fellowships in neuroophthalmology and multiple sclerosis at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Shin is currently Professor of Neurology at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and Director of the Georgetown Multiple Sclerosis and Neuroimmunology Center. Dr. Shin has a special interest in health disparities in multiple sclerosis, as well as visual problems associated with MS and other demyelinating disorders, including neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. To get us started, can you just explain what a neuroophthalmologist is? Sure. Well, you know, there are different kinds of physicians with different specialties. So, for example, neurologists usually focus on the brain and and, and nervous system, right? So that would be a neurologist. And then ophthalmologists are eye doctors. So they focus on treating eye diseases, eye conditions, using medicines and and surgeries to help people with eye issues. So neuro-ophthalmologists actually kind of bridge the gap between neurology and ophthalmology. So for example, some neuro-ophthalmologists started out as neurologists and began to learn more about the eye and then became to focus on the neurology of vision. And by the same token, some neuro-ophthalmologists start out as ophthalmologists, and then they learn more about the, the nervous system, the optic nerves and the brain and how they interact. So again, neuro-ophthalmologists kind of occupy that middle ground between those two specialties. Got it. Thank you. So what role does a neuro-ophthalmologist have in relation to NMOSD? Well, neuromyelitis optic Spectrum disorder, uh, even in its name, the spectrum, uh, refers to the fact that people with NMOSD may have a variety of different symptoms or issues uh, that bring them to diagnosis. But one of the biggest ones actually is visual issues. So when you say NMO, neuromyelitis optica, the optica part of it refers to the fact that many people with NMOSD may have visual issues. They may have inflammation of the optic nerve or nerves, which we call optic neuritis. Perhaps a little bit less commonly, they could have things like double vision or other issues like that. So actually neuro-ophthalmologists often do become involved. Sometimes actually they're the front line. Sometimes someone with NMOSD will present with a visual issue and it's the neuro-ophthalmologist that kind of realizes that NMOSD might be going on. Okay, great. And just to segue from that response, you said that sometimes it's the neuro-ophthalmologist who kind of diagnoses or or sees the NMOSD first. Um, 
So what kind of tests would a neuroophthalmologist use to diagnose NMOSD and other uh, disorders? Or just, let's just start with NMOSD. <laughs> So a common story will be someone will just be minding their own business and will suddenly develop blurred vision in one eye or both eyes or even vision loss. So it may begin as just the subtle blurring of vision. I, I've heard patients say they thought they just had a smudge on their glasses, but sometimes it's very severe and they could lose vision in one eye and sometimes they lose vision completely. That will bring them to an eye doctor typically. Now, the eye doctor, let's say an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, may do an initial evaluation looking for, if you will, run of the mill things. You just need a new glasses prescription. You know, do you have a cataract or something else going on? Usually, pretty quickly, uh, the uh, initial evaluator will realize wait a minute, something's going on here. The eye itself might be okay, but maybe there's a problem with the optic nerve. That's the cable that connects the eye to the brain. And that's often what will get someone sent to a neuro-ophthalmologist. Now, in terms of tests that are done, the initial assessment is often actual and examination. So I think we've all had to look at the uh, eye chart and kind of uh, take a look and see if the vision is blurred or if the vision is 20-20. Other tests might include tests of visual feel that might be you know, trying to check counting fingers in the visual field or maybe doing that on a machine. We have automated visual field machines that can give us that information. Uh, the eye doctor might check color vision, for example, might take a flashlight and shine a light in both eyes, you know, just like in TV, you're using a flashlight and checking the pupillary reaction. When you put all of that information together, the neuroophthalmologist may realize that there is in fact evidence of optic neuritis, inflammation of either one or both optic nerves. At that point, other testing may be done. You know, I mentioned visual field testing. If any of your listeners have had to, you kind of you're like looking at a ping pong ball, you're kind of doing one eye and lights flash and you hit a button to say whether you could see or not see a light. People may use a tool called optical coherence tomography. This sounds fancy. OCT is actually a way to look at the back of the eye and get a sense of the health or thickness of the nerve fiber layer in the back of the eye. Uh, all of that information put together, again, uh, can give us uh, insight into whether one or both optic nerves are involved. And then at that point, really, as again, I think your listeners know, specific testing for NMOSD or other conditions is going to involve some blood tests, right? We're going to need to think about the possibility of NMOSD to make sure that uh, we are ordering the correct tests, specifically looking for aquaporin for antibodies in the blood. Got it. Thank you. And so how would you, I guess, distinguish different optic neuritis related disorders from one another, such as MOG antibody disease, MS, NMOSD, single, single attack optic neuritis, et cetera? Sure. That's an excellent question. And I think it is important to remember that optic neuritis in, in a way, it's simply a description. It says that there's inflammation of the optic nerve, one or both optic nerves. Now, there are many things that could cause optic neuritis. To this day, sometimes people will have optic neuritis and then it'll go away and then it never happens again. It's a one-time only fluke. Maybe it was a viral infection. I have to be honest and say, sometimes we don't really know what causes an isolated optic neuritis. There is another possibility, which is that Optic neuritis is a common presentation or can, be, can occur in people with multiple sclerosis. So again, I think your listeners know that there is a demyelinating disorder that affects the brain and spinal cord called multiple sclerosis. It is not the same thing as NMOSD. Although I have to say when I was training, we didn't realize they were different. We thought they were related conditions. It turns out a completely separate disorder. So optic neuritis can be idiopathic, meaning just its own thing. Sometimes we would say one and done. You just had it and nothing else happened. Sometimes optic neuritis is a part of what turns out to be multiple sclerosis. However, we now recognize that optic neuritis in one eye or both eyes could be a sign of NMOSD, NMO spectrum disorder, or can be associated with other antibodies, not aquaporin-4 antibodies, which we think of as 
a marker of NMOSD, but could be associated with MOG antibodies, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibodies, MOG, or a condition we call MOGAD, MOG antibody associated disorder. So all of these things have to be considered when someone presents with optic neuritis. Now, I will add, sometimes there are clues that might tip us more in one direction than another. For example, the optic neuritis of NMOSD can be more severe at times than what we might see with other conditions and is more likely to involve both eyes. So for example, run-of-the-mill optic neuritis or optic neuritis in MS is almost always in one eye only. But if someone presents and they have both eyes affected, meaning maybe they, maybe they can't see at all because both eyes are affected, that is definitely going to make me think about conditions like NMOSD or maybe uh, MOGAD more commonly. So again, little uh, subtleties may distinguish among the conditions, but it is important to remember that not all optic neuritis is NMO or MS or anything. It can be one of a variety of different conditions. And then not to overly complicate things, but even though I think of it as idiopathic MS, NMO, MOG, it is also true that other conditions can mimic up or can cause optic neuritis, things like infections, things like you know, Lyme disease or other kinds of conditions. Now, usually there are clues when it's one of the other disorders, but we always should exclude other mimics before we kind of settle on our final diagnosis. That makes sense. Thank you. So how does a neuro-ophthalmologist work with other healthcare professionals? For example, where does a neuro-ophthalmologist come in versus a neurologist, optometrist, et cetera? Sure. Well, I already hinted at the fact that often patients with visual issues will see a, their local eye doctor first, a general ophthalmologist or optometrist, because you know, there's no blurred vision. They need to see what's going on. It's often the eye doctor, the optometrist, ophthalmologist who will realize, wait a minute, this isn't a problem of the eye itself. It's not a lens problem or the cornea or the surface of the eye or glasses. This is an optic nerve or brain problem. And they'll make that referral to neuro-ophthalmology. Sometimes it goes the other way. For example, sometimes, as you know, people with NMOSD, people living with NMOSD, maybe they don't have any visual issues. Maybe they had weakness or numbness or some kind of bladder symptom. Maybe they had more of a spinal cord presentation. However, once a diagnosis of NMOSD or MOG has been made, MOGAD, their neurologist may say, I want you to check with the neuro-ophthalmologist just to see uh, if vision has been affected at all or, or to get a baseline examination for future reference. So as I said, we kind of lie in the middle between neurology and ophthalmology. There, there are actually not a lot of us. We're sort of a very small specialty, but I, I, I like to think that we do have an important role, particularly in a condition like NMOSD that can cause a lot of visual issues. Got it. Okay, thanks. And can you briefly just go over what acute treatments are used for optic neuritis in NMOSD? Well, it's interesting because for a long time, we weren't sure what the best way to address optic neuritis was. Again, people, commonly young people would have vision loss and often there's some discomfort, pain on eye movements that can occur. We could recognize that there was inflammation of the optic nerve, but it wasn't clear the best way to address it. So, and this now goes back many decades, but there was an optic neuritis treatment trial where different treatments were studied. One of the arms of the study was placebo, meaning actually there was no treatment, and this was the comparator arm. One group of individuals received lower dose oral steroids, prednisone. And then a third group received higher dose steroids through the vein, intravenous corticosteroid, methylprednisolone. There's a brand named solumedrol that may be used. The interesting result of that study actually was that all three groups had the same ultimate outcome. You know, people don't realize this, that actually all three groups did well, meaning that 90% of the time vision returned whether they were on a placebo or receiving steroids of either type. Now, having said that, the group that received the high dose, the intravenous corticosteroids did have a faster recovery 
Okay, so they recovered more quickly, but everybody ended up in the same place. Now, that led to a period of time when sometimes we would say, well, if you have mild optogritis, maybe I don't even have to treat you. The, the outcome is going to be the same. And the other, I guess, finding in the optic neuritis treatment trial was the recognition that often optic neuritis was a first presentation of what ultimately became multiple sclerosis. And that led to a lot of research into what we call clinically isolated syndrome in the MS world in terms of early MS. Having said all of that, although it is more rare, we now recognize that NMOSD and, and MOGAD can be associated with very severe optic neuritis. And I have to say, I think most of us feel that it is important to treat those forms of optic neuritis early and with, uh, if you will, a relatively strong treatment like maybe using those intravenous corticosteroids. Uh, and again, as, as your listeners may, may be aware, in attacks of NMOSD, we may go to things like plasma exchange, which is kind of washing the blood. And so I guess our lessons are that we should still take optic neuritis seriously, especially when severe. Certainly in the context of NMOSD or MOGAD, we, I, I would say for the most part, we don't want to leave that untreated. But the tools are as we reviewed them. Things like corticosteroids, whether by mouth or perhaps more commonly intravenously at higher dose, or things like plasma exchange or PLEX, a technique again to try to, if you will, wash the blood of any kind of inflammation as best we can. Got it. Thank you. And so when people unfortunately experience visual loss or visual issues following an attack, is that vision loss permanent or is there hope for recovering it? Well, I will say that it's going to vary by the individual. So I mentioned with I don't even have a good word for this, regular or typical optic neuritis. Again, the optic neuritis seen in the optic neuritis treatment trial, again, 90% or so of individuals had their full recovery of vision. Having said that, full vision, visual recovery means the vision returns to better than 2040, which is sort of driving vision, if you will. But often individuals could compare and they'll still know that the optic neuritis eye was not quite as good as their other unaffected eye. So that's always been the case. With NMO spectrum disorder, a more rare condition, the optic neuritis classically has been felt to be or observed to be more severe and sometimes not associated with good recovery. In fact, that's kind of a, it was a signal for us. If somebody had optic neuritis and they did not recover their vision well, we were like, wait a minute, that's a little bit unusual. Maybe we should check for a condition like NMO SD. I do want to reassure your listeners, however, that people with NMOSD who are living with NMOSD actually can have good recovery of vision. And in my experience, I've had individuals who have been completely blind, but uh, thankfully have responded well to treatments if we kind of figure it out early and get them on treatment quickly and had good recovery of vision, especially early on in the disease course. So it is maybe harder to recover in someone who's had many episodes of optic neuritis and has already begun to lose vision. But these days, as, as, as you increase awareness of this condition, I like to think that we're diagnosing it more quickly and more accurately and allowing individuals to access the high efficacy therapies that are available now. And as a result, the outcomes can be better. So this idea that, well, if you have NMOSD, you know, it's going to be so severe, you know, you're absolutely going to lose vision and, and have difficulty walking. I don't think that's true anymore. I think with early diagnosis and use of effective therapies, basically the recognition of the condition, I think we can do a good job of preserving vision and ambulation and other symptoms. So, so it's really all about awareness and getting people on highly effective therapies as early as possible. Great. Thank you. Finally, is there rehabilitation for optic neuritis? Anything someone can do to help um, help after after an attack or even supplements that help? It is a good question, and I do get asked that a lot. And different individuals may provide different answers, so I'm just going to give you my opinion. 
as I said, to me, the key is early recognition and early application of effective treatments. And I think that's really the best thing we can do to try to ensure or, or encourage a good recovery and, and really to prevent other episodes from happening in the first place. I mean, that's always the best outcome is if we can prevent additional episodes of optic neuritis or transverse myelitis or any kind of, you know, brain or brain stem or spinal cord episode. But what if an episode has occurred, or maybe this was your first episode and, and you wanted to come out? Well, I would say that I don't think that things like vision therapy and those kinds of techniques are necessarily effective. Now, again, there may be differences of opinion. I, I do know that there are providers out there, uh, a lot of optometrists or neuro-optometrists may be believers in vision therapy to try to bring vision back. But I actually really just, I can't endorse that from my own training or practice. If it, if it benefits you, that's fantastic. But the tricky thing is that, as, as I hinted, there is the potential for optic neuritis to improve with time and with treatment on its own. So, you know, it may not be the therapy that fixed it. It may have been time that helped to fix that. Now, I will say that sometimes if vision loss is severe and there has not been good recovery, or if the vision loss is affecting both eyes and thus you don't have really a good way to compensate for it. There are forms of low vision therapy. This is really adaptive therapy that can be helpful. And so they're not like neuro-ophthalmologists, low vision specialists are not as common, but if you have access to them, if you can find them or be referred to them, they have lots of either training or technology like microscopes that can help or special cameras that can magnify images so that you can read or watch television. And I do recommend that type of evaluation for those who do have significant visual impairment. Hey, thank you. Those are all the questions that I have, but I wanted to open it up in case there was anything you'd like to add or anything you'd, you'd think the listeners would like to know. Well, I really salute you and, and others who are uh, making the effort to get the word out and to educate the community as well as providers about NMO spectrum disorder. The reason I say this is because as I hinted, we thought we understood optic neuritis back in the 1990s and early 2000s, because again, a condition like multiple sclerosis is maybe more common or more familiar to many individuals. But since the early 2000s, once we were able to definitively show that NMO spectrum disorder is a distinct condition that requires different treatments and has a different outcome. I think that our field is out to rethink, but what if someone shows up and they have optic neuritis? Maybe I shouldn't assume that it's something like MS. I should consider the possibility of NMO SD and people need to understand how that is tested. I'm sure you've covered this in another podcast in terms of the importance of using a cell-based assay to check or aquaporin-4 antibodies or MOG um, antibodies as well. So that mission to maybe educate the community of providers as well as people um, living with NMOSD is really just so important. We're in a way, we're in the infancy of the period of time of treatment of NMOSD, right? Currently three different FDA approved treatment options for NMOSD, each one I believe to be highly effective but they're not going to work if we don't give them to the correct patients and, and figure out NMOSD as early as possible. And so, you know, these kinds of programs are just really so important. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and volunteering your time to answer questions. I know our community members really benefit from these, these podcasts. So sure. thank you so much. And I all hope right. a great rest of your day.